Thanks very much. Uh, thanks to John and the organizers for uh, inviting me to participate today. Uh, thanks to the earlier speakers. You've set this up beautifully. And in particular, Meredith, this is going to be in uh, really uh, a clear continuity with what you've just presented. Um, unlike what we've heard from Kaiser and Mayo, I have much more a story like what Meredith has told you about mixed results, uh, not clear cut. Um, also, it's coming from Ontario, uh, which I realize is kind of dangerous thing to do in Alberta, but nonetheless, uh, we're going to do that because that's, that's where, where I'll give you the system perspective and then drill down to more primary care. So we're going to go more into the weeds and, and then uh, give you some, I think, lessons to learn from the, uh, from the Ontario uh, experience. Um, so I don't think I have uh, industry uh, conflicts to, um, uh, this. the culture I come from is you're supposed to declare these kinds of things, I don't think I have those. I will want to talk to you about the role of primary care. You may not all in this room be converted, and I hope that you will be. Um, I want to talk about Canada and international context. I won't go into that very much because other speakers today have son done such a beautiful job with that. Uh, I will tell you a little bit about Ontario's primary care transformation without making you learn the 22 uh, you know, different models that we have in, in primary care and all the acronyms that go with them, mostly starting with F. We decide everything should be based around family, so we have family health groups, family health networks, family health teams. Anyway, it's all very confusing and I won't go into that, but I will talk a little bit about patient, formal patient enrollment, new payment models, interprofessional teams. I realize that these are international directions. Um, hopefully some of this information is timely for you in Alberta as you're considering and embarking on uh, payment reform in primary care in particular and across other sectors as well. I, I do want to talk about successes and challenges that we've encountered uh, in, in, in the Ontario context um, with potentially lessons. I don't, I don't presume to come tell you what, you what you ought to do, but there are some, I think, I, I think there are some things not to do and I, I, won't, I won't feel too reticent to share those with you. And then I know we're going to have good, good time for discussion both after the section, section and after the break. Um, so here comes the uh, converting you to um, the importance of primary care if you weren't already. And uh, so I'm going to talk about two things. One is just what is the number of health services accessed each day in primary care in relation to other sectors? And then how is primary care related to health outcomes? So the first one, uh, this is not my slide, this is courtesy, this does come from um, uh, my organization, the Institute. Um, uh, this was done actually under Andreas's watch when he was the CEO, it was done by colleagues of mine. I think this particularly came from Doug Manuel, who's now in Ottawa. And so this idea is not new, it's called the Ecology of Healthcare. It was first published by Carr White in the New England Journal in 1960 and has been upgraded, updated several times since then. But it essentially just looks at, and this particular version is per day. So in Ontario, there are 137,000 primary care physician visits each day and 50 hip and knee replacements. These data are a little bit old now, but they're not changed very much in terms of what is the ratio. And the focus of the healthcare system and the attention of the healthcare system is often at the pointy end of, of this diagram. And I'm not saying that it shouldn't be. There are a lot of costs that are incurred there, a lot of avoidable costs that are incurred there, but we tend not to focus very much on this enormous amount of contact that the public has with the healthcare system with the 137,000 visits. Primary care, in addition to having this huge kind of population contact, has also, this is largely the work of Barbara Starfield and her colleagues, it's also been associated with lower mortality and premature mortality and infant mortality and uh, uh, decreased disparities in all kinds of outcomes that people care about. And this is when comparing countries, when comparing US counties, just comparing places that have strong primary care versus weak primary care. There also tends to be higher satisfaction in relation to overall costs, which starts to sound a lot like the theme of, of today. Um, so uh, I won't go very much into international comparisons. You've seen tons of them today. But just, to, just a little tiny bit of background is that in Canada, we do have some constraints uh, to our system that other places don't have nearly as much of. And so on this one slide, you can see that Canada has about one primary care practitioner per thousand population and about 1.1 specialist per thousand population. And that other countries, and that the, the, uh, the very close to the OECD average for 
primary care, but very much below the OECD average for specialty care. And so for those in the room who are practicing uh, in family medicine or primary care in Alberta, uh, you will find, as we do in the rest of the country, uh, the thing that drives you crazy all day long and that takes up all of your energy is trying to make an effective referral trying to refer to a specialist. You can refer to a specialist for somebody for a shoulder and hear three months later that that surgeon only does knees. Like that's a common, common experience across our country. And so it's just one of the many constraints. In Ontario, we have very few hospital beds per capita uh, after we did our, our whole healthcare restructuring thing. And that may not be the case here, but we face constraints in imaging, specialist referrals, and hospitalization that is different from many other uh, uh, places around the world. Uh, internationally, I think you've heard about the triple aim and also the quadruple aim today about in improving the experience of care, improving population health and controlling per capita costs and having to do all those three things at the same time, whether that's even possible or feasible. You've actually seen a few examples of that today. Sometimes more commonly you can do two and not all three. Canada um, spends a lot uh, per capita relative to the OECD average. Our health status is pretty good. It's actually slightly above the OECD average, but as we've heard several times today already, our health system performance is consistently below comparators. And I'm gonna show you how this looks in primary care, and it looks messy, and I apologize. This is the messiest slide uh, and most complicated one that I will be showing you, and this is where I guess I'm gonna see if the pointer works way over at an angle. But you can see that uh, Canada's overall ranking, this is the Commonwealth Fund uh, study that you heard, you saw a lot of different extracts of that earlier today um, in Reinhardt's talk and in other places. And you can see that Canada out of 11 countries in primary care overall ranking ranks 10th out of 11 with only the US at the bottom. So uh, beating only the US at the bottom. This is around quality, access, efficiency, equity, healthy lives, health, health expenditures, you name it. Um, so this is very sobering for us across the country. Uh, wait times in particular, affordability looks to be better than in some other places with the exception of drugs and, and Reinhardt put his finger on that this morning as well. But you can see that in, in, in primary care, when we look at things like this, we always thought we were the leader. We led a lot of the models, we led a lot of the education, we led a lot of the accreditation way back in the 60s and 70s and 80s. Uh, and I think we've realized, we realized through uh, measures like this, as flawed as they are, that based on surveys, their patient self-report, they're all those, uh, their, their response issues, they're all those things, but these are consistent over many, many cycles and over many studies. Um, this is information from Alberta, and I, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't presume to, um, uh, to, uh, uh, to, 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 to say where Alberta ranks uh, within Canada, except to say that this information suggests not at the top. I'll also share with you Ontario is also not at the top. But this suggests that this information, uh, which was prepared for the uh, uh, Alberta Ministry, uh, of health uh, suggests that Alberta is not at the top of the heap in having a regular doctor or same day next day appointments or ease in finding after hours care or getting same day next day uh, answers to phone calls. And Canada generally does very poorly on these measures. Some of these were below the United States. We are never ahead of very many other countries on any study that's been done on these kind of metrics. Um, Health systems around the world are facing these similar challenges, and that's been a big theme for today as well. There are rapid changes in teams, electronic medical records, guidelines, payment reform. So in addition to what we've heard already today, Australia has gone through all these meso level of primary care organizations, GP divisions, Medicare locals. They now have PHNs, primary health networks, where they're trying to organize local networks of primary care. Canada, of course, is different in every province and territory. The College of Family Physicians of Canada is promoting something called the patient's medical home, only slightly different from the patient-centered medical home concept in the US. It just had to be called something different. US, of course, we've heard a lot about just now, including um, uh, Meredith talking a lot about the terms that are coming up in MACRA and, and Robert also referring to those uh, in terms of US embarking on major, major payment reform. The UK, of course, we heard constant, constant turmoil and uh, no long periods of, of stability. Uh, 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 lots of things that happen, uh, very hard to keep up actually with what's, what goes on all the time. New Zealand has independent practitioner associations, the Netherlands has regulated 
competition, other countries as we heard from other presentations today. So it's not just that you and Alberta are embarking on change or continuing to change or that we in Ontario have been or that we need to do this as a country in Canada, but that, this, that these are really um, uh, challenges that are, are, are being uh, faced around the world. Uh, Canada and primary care um, uh, embarked on this uh, in the early 2000s with the deputy uh, ministers getting together and deciding that we needed to have interprofessional teams across the country, group practices and networks, patient enrollment, patient incentive schemes, new governance models, additional providers, EMR implementation, quality improvement support, 24-7 access, leased by phone. And you can see that Alberta, Ontario, and Quebec, these, this slide is a bit dated now, particularly the electronic medical record uptake is 80 or 85 percent across the country and in most provinces, and it was lower at that time. But um, you can see that um, Alberta, Ontario, and Quebec have certainly led in, in, these, uh, in many of these innovations, but that some are present in every province and territory and are gaining, uh, 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 are, are advancing and are continuing to, uh, to gain traction in other places. So I'm going to tell you a, a particular Ontario story. I promise not to get too far down into the weeds, but I need to tell you a few things just so you know what we did, just so you can think about what you ought to do. So the thing that we did is um, we implemented blended capitation, and, and as Meredith alluded to, this was by choice. That was that one slide. So, so, so family physicians had a complete choice of, of models, so there was a lot of selection factor that occurred. Um, there were age-sex-specific capitation payments uh, in, in, inside a defined and actually very large basket of services. Uh, there was a requirement to continue to keep billing fee-for-service for accountability purposes and also to have a small incentive uh, for productivity that was still in there, so it was a 15% payment for in-basket services. There's formal rostering where your patient had to sign a contract, actually. Now, contract's not really binding on the patient at all, of course, in the Canadian healthcare system. You can't tell them, you can't go here, you have to go there, so Ontario didn't do that, but nonetheless, uh, patients were asked to formally sign a document saying that you were their provider. Uh, there were incentives that were put into the system for severe mental illness, chronic disease management, there were pay for performance thresholds for immunization and cancer screening. I'll show you some of those results in a few minutes. There was a completely open and free choice of models, and in the early years this was based on an income projection. So can you imagine, you, you make a request and you open the envelope and it says, Dr. Glazier, if you switch to capitation, your income is going to go down 5%. And I say, thank you very much. I'm just going to stay in the fee-for-service system. On the other hand, if it says, Dr. Glazier, your income is going to go up 42%, and we expect you to do exactly the same stuff that you're doing now in fee-for-service. You're already in an enhanced fee-for-service model. You already get these incentives. You already have to provide after-hours care. We're not asking you to do anything different, but your income can go up 42%. How many people do you think volunteered for that? <laughs> Okay, so 40% of the workforce in three years opened that envelope that said 42% and joined the model. And I'll, I'll show you that uptake in a, in a couple of minutes. And the people who didn't, the people who didn't got the income projection that was negative. So the Ontario Ministry of Health a few years ago made a decision and they no longer provide income projections. <laughs> They've also limited entry to this model which they now see as fairly expensive. Uh, which is probably not even applicable today because everybody who would have made their choice has already made it. So they could probably open it up now and have no problem whatsoever uh, but, uh, because the selection has already been done. And we've trained all our trainees to really want to be in this model and to practice in this model. Um, so the, uh, uh, the, um, the, uh, 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 so the free choice of models, you could stay in fee-for-service, you could be in a blended fee-for-service model, or you could be in this blended capitation model, and a few doctors are in salaried models uh, in our community health centers. Um, if you belong to a blended capitation model, you could also ask to be part of an interprofessional team where the government would pay for nurse practitioners, social workers, pharmacists, mental health workers, and others uh, even now physiotherapists, uh, to be on your team that they would pay for, they pay the entire salary, you get an executive director, you'd be in the front of the line for electronic medical records, but you had to be in an alternate plan that was capitation or salary. You could not be in any brand of fee-for-service. 
So uh, these are the weeds I won't get into. You can see there are community health centers that are community governed uh, where physicians and other, everybody else is on salary. We had two brands of capitation, the Family Health Network and the Family Health Organization, and mostly now it's the Family Health Organization because it has a higher capitation payment. We have an enhanced fee for service, the Family Health Group, that has all the same requirements as the blended capitation one, and it's for those people who didn't want to make the switch. We have special arrangements for rural and northern, uh, for solo physicians in the ca comprehensive uh, care model, and then we have these family health teams, uh, which you have to be in an alternate model for. So the, the transformation in payment was dramatic. I don't think anything like this has happened anywhere else in Canada, and I'm not sure that in the world this kind of transformation has happened as quickly. It really happened in a, in a period of about three years. I'm giving you a decade here between 2002 and 2012, but you can see in 2002, 94% of physicians were in traditional fee-for-service. Just straight up, send in your bills, get your payment uh, according to the fee schedule, and very, very few at that time were in capitation or salary or some other model. Model. By, two, by 2012, and this has leveled off since then, capitation-based payment was close to 40% of physicians. There had been a big stampede between 2006 and 2010, uh, three, four years into this model, which is there in green. The fee-for-service blended payment system uh, in red there was another 30%. And those left in fee-for-service, only half of them were even comprehensive anymore. Most of the ones, many of the ones uh, still in straight fee-for-service were doing GP psychotherapy and sports medicine and uh, some emergency medicine, so it's become a very, uh, a, a quite a small group, not more than 10% of the, of the pool that are still in straight fee-for-service in Ontario. What happened to payments? Well, this is kind of scary if you're a payer, uh, really scary, because you can see fee-for-service on the bottom there. If you've replaced, if you've only got 15% of fee-for-service left and 40% of your workforce has gone into capitation, fee-for-service ought to go down, shouldn't it? And it didn't or very slightly. Now, the growth, uh, it would have grown. Uh, it would not have stayed static as it did through the 1990s and early 2000s. But you can see pretty much all the growth that you can see there in orange is primary care models. Uh, Yes, it, would, it, it actually, I have a, a, a colleague in, in, uh, in Kingston, Ontario, Queen's University, who got permission from Ontario physicians to link their model of care with their tax files. Believe that? Would you agree to have somebody look at your tax files? And he found 42% increase in fee for those who switched. They thought they had a 15% increase and they had a 42% increase. Um, however, the interesting thing about this is that the proceduralists and specialists and subspecialists had similar increases in the same period of time such that the gap between primary care and specialty care did not narrow. The gap did not grow, but it also did not narrow. So the payers in the early mid-2000s there were, were being pretty generous with everybody, uh, which people now uh, forget. Um, so there are some successes of the Ontario transformation. Before I get to the lessons, I'll just outline a couple of the things that I think went well. So the primary care workforce has certainly grown and diversified. Interprofessional teams are available to a quarter of the population now. Um, medical student preference for family medicine has increased dramatically, and I'll show you a graph of that. Physician satisfaction and incomes improved. Well, being asked to say do the same thing with much higher income, we'll do that for you. Um, a high proportion of the population, 94% uh, as of the last reading, has uh, on, on a random digit dialing survey will say they have a, a regular primary care provider. So that's awfully high. That's higher than other jurisdictions in Canada. Uh, it, mind you, at the beginning of this reform, it was 91%. So again, uh, maybe big expenditure for a very small impact. Most practices in Ontario now have EMRs, and I think this is common across Canada with one or two provinces as exceptions. Team models have been associated with improved, uh, uh, improved, improved quality. Uh, actually, team models have quality improvement plans, but there's also evidence of improved diabetes care and cancer screening over time in relation to being in one of these models, even though there were also selection factors involved. So medical student choice for family medicine was 23% in the early 2000s, at roughly the same as it was in the U.S. And since that time in Canada, it's gone up to 38%, and in the U.S. it's gone down to 9%. Uh, in the most recent round, sadly. Um, now, this is not particularly due to the Ontario uh, result, but because other provinces were doing, this is, these are Canadian data from the Canadian Inter uh, Resident Matching Service, and other provinces were doing many other things to attract graduates as well, but there's been quite a turnaround uh, in contrast to the US. 
These are the changes in diabetes screening and uh, processes of care and colorectal cancer screenings. The family health teams started at a lower level and improved more and ended up at a higher level with diabetes care compared with other models after controlling for case mix, age, sex, rurality, selection factors. Colorectal cancer had a dramatic improvement but from, from all models, but starting at a very low baseline. And this was largely the work of Cancer Care Ontario. We had signs all over our bus shelters and all over our transportation systems and all over the place for, for this Can You See Through Me campaign around colorectal screening. So we had quite a dramatic uh, improvement over time, but really in all models uh, of, of care. What are some of the challenges and what are some of the things that in Alberta and elsewhere people ought to think about? Well, there were increased costs for the payers. So the choice of capitation, as I mentioned, was largely based on increased income. Thousands of doctors joined rapidly. This entry has now been limited to a small number per month and only into underserved areas. There was a selection of healthier practices. So when people think about capitation, they think about cream skimming, cherry picking, et cetera. Um, our payment system did not have case mix adjustment. And when I say that to my American colleagues, they shake their head in dismay and wonder, and, and maybe international colleagues as well. Um, but what happened is entire, it wasn't that doctors decided to just enroll healthy patients. Doctors by and large enrolled their whole practice. But what they tended to do is the practices that were sicker tended to get an income uh, a statement that said that they weren't gonna go up or they weren't gonna go up very much and so they stayed in fee for service. So th this was, um, and so paying the same for sick and healthy patients didn't mean that only healthy patients got into the system, but it did mean that healthier practices preferentially did. It meant that the sicker practices were stuck in the older models, and if you think about being in an older model means you can't have a team, then you have something perverse going on where the sicker, sickest practices can't get the resources that they need. There's a misalignment with system needs, and this is a, also a lesson for a potential one for Alberta, is that the issue when you have a, a, a defined practice and you're given a payment to look after them, in the Canadian system, we don't limit people going somewhere else. I'm not sure how this is going to be dealt with under MACRA and in, and in Medicare to provide um, a choice for where people go but have them assigned uh, in, in, a, in a comprehensive payment to somebody, what happens. So in Canada, we're not willing to penalize patients who go somewhere else. Uh, I know in some other countries, their co-payments or deductibles, we're not willing to do that. And so we feel in capitation that we have to uh, deduct that, those funds from the doctor because the doctor, we don't pay the doctor twice. We don't pay them a capitation payment and then have some other doctor provide some of the fee for service that's in their basket of services because they went to a walk-in clinic. But then when you remove it from the doctor, it's actually the patient's decision. And then in Ontario, we haven't penalized those visits to emergency departments. So what we've done, in effect, is said that we will um, uh, reward you, uh, and this is the biggest bonus in our system, other than the capitation bonus payment, this is 20% of capitation. We will give you a gigantic bonus if your patients preferentially go to the emergency department and not a walk-in clinic. Now, does that, make, does that make sense in the country that has the highest emergency department visit rates in the OECD, but that's what we did, okay? So there's the, there's the incentive that we set up, um, that we get a gigantic bonus, and you can imagine the urban-rural split because there are no walk-in clinics in rural areas. So this was good for rural areas, but also suburban areas that didn't have too many walk-in clinics did well financially, even though their patients were going to emergency departments at an enormous rate. And inner city doctors who couldn't get a team had very low emergency department visit rates, but because there's so many walk-in clinics and patients lived out, of, you know, out in the suburbs and commuted in, that they really, really got hit hard. So it's one of those things to really think about, particularly in urban areas. So this created an incentive to send patients to the emergency department. I don't know how long the wait is in Edmonton right now for a low acuity problem. In Toronto, it's six hours today, right now. Uh, for a low acuity problem, the wait would be six hours in the emergency department. I don't know what it would be here in Edmonton or, or in Calgary. Um, and, then, uh, and then urban practices with the lowest emergency department visits and demonstrably the best after hours care were the ones who didn't get any of the bonus at all. And 20% of capitation, which is 60 to 70% of your income, is a lot of income. We also, the problem with not uh, doing any case mix adjustment um, was that, so we, I'll, I'll just explain this slide a little bit. Um, the blue line is the age sex capitation rate and along the uh, bottom axis there, along the X axis, we have income quintiles based on area of residence. So this is Statistics Canada 
thing. Um, so the lowest income quintiles on your left and the highest income quintiles on your right. And you can see that the um, uh, age sex capitation rate is fairly flat across income quintiles. The problem with that is that need is not flat across income quintiles. And you can see that we measured need using the Johns Hopkins ACGs, and we measured the morbidity burden. And you can see the morbidity burden is substantially higher in the red dotted line in the lowest income quintile and lowest in the highest income quintile. So you can see if your practice is in a low income area, you are getting dramatically underpaid for your patient needs. And if you're in a high income area, you are being dramatically overpaid for your patient's needs. Um, so the system challenges, and I'm coming to the end, um, the system challenges were around the inverse care law and inequity, so only the capitation models could have a team. Sicker practices couldn't join capitation, so they couldn't have a team. Those needing a team could not get it the most. And fewer in large urban areas joined capitation because they weren't getting the access bonus. They had concentrations of sick patients. And so immigrants, for example, recent immigrants are dramatically underrepresented in the family health team model. Um, and the family health team model in general has healthier and wealthier patients than average for Ontario. Pay for performance, I'm going to show you this in a minute. Pay for performance in our setting didn't really perform all that well with cancer screening and diabetes care. It was costly with little evidence of impact. Timely access to care did not improve. Uh, Reinhardt and I were both at a conference last May and people came up to me one by one and said, Rick, hasn't Canada fixed its wait time problems yet? And so I'll show you as our wait time uh, problems in primary care. Uh, they're, they're all flat lines. Um, and uh, so timely access is certainly our largest system, one of our largest system challenges. And there are no provisions for timely care in the new models, apart from this penalty for outside use. And no models, these models were all designed in 1999 and 2000, and they started to be implemented in 2001, and not a single provision of these models has changed since then. Inequities were well known four or five years in, and nothing has changed, and we can talk later if you like about why that, why that might have happened. I won't go into great detail about this. These are uh, uh, publications that uh, one of my, th this is particularly from Tara Kieran, one of my uh, uh, very close colleagues who's worked on, we've worked on this together as a team. Um, so there was no change in uh, cerv cervix or breast cancer screening at all over this period of time. There were increases that I've shown you in, in colorectal cancer screening largely related to outside factors. The combined annual cost of these bonuses in Ontario is more than 35 million. And the, uh, apart from colorectal cancer, the cancer screening rates in Ontario in the last 25 years have not changed by more than 1%. So cervical cancer screening mammography have not changed by more than 1%. We're spending all of this money. And colorectal cancer did go up and has now leveled off and is not moving anymore either. So we're spending, a, and, and what happens in pay for performance is you have to pay the high performers. And we didn't have any payments that we, like we heard earlier for improvement. So we only paid those people uh, at high levels of performance. And Andreas was quite right when he said, it's how many of your patients get mammography, not did you have a conversa an informed conversation with them about mammography. Because of course, one of those is easy to measure and one of those is very hard. Even though this, these graphs only go to the year 2010, I can assure you the last quarter of 2016 looks exactly like this. So this is a survey. Uh, some of these are survey results and some of them are from administrative data. So the percent with a primary care uh, physician is actually very high in Ontario. As I mentioned, it's now up to 94%. So that's all good news. However, in red, you can see same day, next day appointments are now hovering at around between 40 and 45%. They've never been, they've not been better than that, either on the Commonwealth Fund survey or on the Healthcare Experience survey, or this one, this came from a, a survey called the Primary Care Access Survey, and it has not improved over all this time. So all, and remember, we had massive investment in all these new models during this period of time. Walk-in clinic visits have not changed at all in terms of, you know, 30, 40% of the population. Emergency department visit rate keep rising uh, over time. So we really don't see any changes that would suggest better access or uh, to after-hours care or timeliness of care during any of this time period. Um, interestingly, we were able more recently, uh, because they changed the nature of the survey so that it could be linked, and our capitation plans, these are same-day, next-day appointments, and you can see on the y-axis, uh, you know, from zero up to about 70%. Canada uh, sits at about 40, 45% on the Commonwealth Fund survey, and you can see that uh, although we've spent all this money on our capitation plans, timely access is not better uh, than it is in good old straight fee-for-service or enhanced fee-for-service. 
Um, this is more recent work uh, from, again, from, from Tara uh, and, and, and other mem members of our team. And uh, uh, what she did is she did not differentiate between all of our different models. So our FIGs, FINs, FITs, FOs. If you were in a patient enrollment model, you were included in a medical home, and everybody else who was just in straight fee for service was left behind. And you can see the bottom, the bottom lines on these graphs are all those left behind. And I'm just showing you diabetes care and breast cancer screening, but cervical cancer screening and, um, uh, and uh, colorectal look exactly the same as this. Were those left behind being seen by fee-for-service physicians, whether they were comprehensive or focused practice, uh, were far, far below the level. And so the difference between our models um, are small, but the difference between those in a model and not in a model are really, really large. There are undoubtedly patient factors and system factors involved here. Some patients don't want a provider. They don't see the need, but these are people who had a need, like diabetes or cancer screening, who were absolutely not getting it. So just to finish up, some lessons that may be applicable uh, to Alberta. Uh, are around not setting, and, and, and I love the fact that you're doing pilots. I think that's absolutely fabulous. We did not do that. We just rolled it out and tried to sell it as hard as we could. And nobody bought at the beginning until the rate went up high enough. And so when the price got high, everybody stampeded into it. So the, I think to be nimble, prepare to change, prepare to change uh, how the incentives are aligned, see what's working, make rapid cycle evaluations and change things, have good measurement systems. Um, and prepare to adjust the models, I think, is the right thing to do. Um, we implemented an evaluation that started uh, five, six years after these plans came into effect, and by then it was very, very hard, and with, with, with no built-in mechanisms. It was very hard to even say whether family health teams were a good idea or not so far down the road and with such weak measurement. Directing resources to those with the greatest needs and aligning incentives, so I think case mix adjustment is critical, and whether that's done on socioeconomic status or on previous diagnoses, I don't think it matters a whole lot. The literature suggests it doesn't matter exactly the details of how you do it, but please do it. Um, these systems sometimes are costly to procure, but the Canadian Institute for Health Information, CAIHI, has a new system that's now available called the POP, and it's a very, very, as far as we can tell when we've looked at it, it's an excellent grouper. So it's, it's excellent for case mix adjustment and will not cost your government anything. So uh, CAIHI is, is uh, making this available starting now. The, 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 the most recent version just came out in December, and it is available to you if you want to do case mix adjustment. Mitigate or, elim or eliminate negation for urban centers. So these, uh, the urban doctors in Ontario uh, uh, demonstrably have low emergency department visit rates, um, have great after hours care. Uh, their overall cost of ambulatory care is lower than doctors in the rest of the province, and they are missing out on a bonus that amounts to between $35,000 and $40,000 per doctor who get that bonus. And, that, and, and so they're being severely penalized per, for providing excellent care uh, because their patients are going to walk in clinics instead of emergency departments, which arguably is a, a, a lower cost place to go. Um, so directing attention to system priorities around, the other thing that we didn't do in Ontario is we didn't really change governance structures. Uh, we didn't uh, uh, put any requirements at the time uh, for timely access. Uh, there were some after hours requirements that were not uh, properly monitored or, or our Auditor General has really criticized the government a lot uh, for uh, not monitoring uh, and, and uh, assuring uh, adherence to, to people who, who needed to do their after hours clinics. Uh, they signed a contract saying they would and many of them didn't. Um, and then considering these issues that have been raised earlier of risk, risk and cost sharing, bundled payments, these are all things I think to, to consider as well. So in conclusion, I'll just say I was at, a, um, uh, I was at a, a conference last March in Washington, D.C. called the Starfield Summit. And uh, the, um, it was a lot about payment reform uh, in Canada, the U.K., uh, particularly in the U.S. And the conclusion that was reached from that is that the three worst ways to pay doctors are fee-for-service, capitation, and salary. Thanks very much. <laughs>